Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey guys, welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. I'm Mike and Davina. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, I'm really excited because I'm chatting with a good friend of mine, Dean Nelson. Now, Dean and I actually go back quite a bit. Uh, years ago, my band, we were called Falls, and uh, we were looking for a producer to work with. And our band, we were kind of like a little electronic meets rocks, almost like if Weezer, Phoenix, Coldplay, and The Killers kind of mash up their sound. That's something similar to what we were. So we were looking for a producer, and I ended up going to Canadian Music Week, uh, now, this is maybe going back like five or six years. And at Canadian Music Week, there was a producer panel. So I wanted to go check it out, learn a little bit more about production and get to know the people that were on the panel. And one of the people who was up on the panel answering questions was Dean. And Dean had shared a lot of stuff that I didn't know about. I had never heard of him before, but he, he was talking about how he started off learning engineering. He started as a DJ and then eventually kind of worked his way up. And he ended up working alongside Jack Joseph Puig, which if you know Jack, Jack actually mixed one of my favorite Weezer records, Pinkerton, which obviously caught my attention. And then he also talked about how he worked up through the ranks. And after years of working with Jack, he eventually ended up working with Beck. Now, Beck is another person that my band was really into. And I love the sound of the Beck records and I love how uh, lush they sound and how big and and really atmospheric they are. So naturally, I was really interested in getting to know Dean. And, um, you know, I, I had this thought in the back of my mind, like, we need to work with this guy. So after the presentation, I just kind of walked up to him and, and was like, man, like, I got to get to know you. I got to listen to more of your work. I have to work with you. I know that already. Let's let's do some work together. So. I ended up giving him a card, and uh, a little while later, we ended up reconnecting, and and sure enough, we ended up releasing a record together, and it was awesome. It's one of my favorite records that I've ever made as a musician, and maybe in the show notes, I'll leave a link to some of the material so you can check it out. But all of that story aside, Dean is a really awesome dude, and he really knows his stuff, and you have to. If you're working with guys like Jack Joseph Puig, Neil Avron, Mark Trombino, you got to know a couple things or two, right? So I'm so excited to have him on here. I think he shares a lot of really great stories and a lot of really great insight. And as he reveals in the interview, he does teach music production these days. So I think that uh, you could tell when you listen to him talk about things, because he has this very great way of describing uh, his workflow and his mindset behind things. And I, I think you're going to learn a lot from that as well. And one last story that I wanted to quickly add to this that we don't really get into in the interview, but I think it's worth noting, is that if you've ever played around with the Waves Pig Child or Pig Tech plugins, Dean actually had a big role in helping to create those. And there's even a preset in the Pig Tech called Dean's Vocals. And this is the Dean that we're talking to today. So uh, very, very cool. And uh, if you've ever had a chance to play with those plugins, you know that they're really great and you should definitely check them out. So anyway, let's jump into the interview. I know you're going to love it. Dean, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So for people who might not be familiar with who you are or how you got into production, can you give us a little bit of your background on your story? Yeah, um, I'm originally from the States down in uh, North Carolina and, um, you know, going through college, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I had um, a background kind of, I was into DJing, kind of like, uh, you know, hip hop and electronic kind of culture, I suppose. Um, but really just a fan of, fan of music just growing up. Um, so anyways, I was, you know, meandering through college and at a certain point, a friend of mine said, you know, you know what you can go to school for is designing recording studios. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Architecture sound, it was pretty interesting. And, um, so I started looking into recording schools cause in North Carolina, it's a pretty small town and, um, you know, in your high school checklist, there's not recording engineer or producer or anything like that. That's on the list. It's your standard kind of, uh, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher, things like that. <laughs> but um, found this uh, school here in Ontario where I'm actually teaching now, the Ontario Institute of Audio Recording Technology. And um, I, that was one of the places I looked into, a couple of the Berkeley and Full Sail and some of the other specific uh, recording programs, because I was already done with like a two-year college program. So I kind of had my uh, like liberal arts kind of things covered, so I didn't need to go back to a four-year program. And I wanted something completely focused on it. So I had um, been up to Toronto, and then I would like the city. I was like, oh, this school's not too far from there. 
came up to Detroit, checked the school out. So it was great. Moved up here. Uh, this was 1999, 2000. Um, yeah, that's it. That's how I got into the school. And from, from then on, I was kind of sold. Um, and then so I got into mixing, really focused on mixing because I wanted to understand the full record making process. I had started off assisting and doing a lot of tracking sessions and we weren't doing a lot of mixing. So I kind of, kind of pushed to try to find, uh, a, you know, where I can learn mixing. And I guess we can uh, kind of get into that shortly of that process. Cool. Yeah. And you ended up after you graduated, you ended up working with guys like JJP and a couple others, right? That's right. So, um, uh, about nine months out of school with a good recommendation from the school, I got a call from the studio and, um, Oh, in Burbank, California, called Ocean, not Ocean Way. It's a place called Ocean. It's still there. Ocean Studios, Burbank. If you check it out, I actually just went to check it out, see what they're up to uh, yesterday. Awesome. In kind of preparation. Um, but um, it's a great place. They have an old Neve. Right when I got there, they had uh, basically put two Neves together, kind of like Re Revolution has done in Studio A. And the Neve they got actually is from this place in Detroit, and I forget the name of it. It's a it's a pretty well known. Uh, place in Detroit. Anywho, um, I was at Ocean Studios in Burbank, you know, for, uh, again, getting it from school, a good recommendation, drove out with my girlfriend, then now wife, and uh, started there just as like the assistant. Actually, the interview, the job position was for tech, which was not for me. I, I suck at soldering and stuff like that. <laughs> but anyways, it slowly went into, you know, in, um, assisting or interning, and then I got a chance to kind of go assisting by just kind of cutting my teeth and, and practicing and using the time uh, anytime it wasn't booked. And the uh, then assistant wanted to go up to manage the studio, and then I got that. Um, the assistant thing with some kind of, you know, bumps and bruises here and there through that process. And after a couple of years there, we would do, we would do a lot of tracking. And uh, I was curious more about, like, the mixing because that time in early 2000s, the budgets were shifting and, and, and it, that console at that point in time didn't have automation. So uh, I think it now has flying faders. But so it was a lot of tracking, a lot of beds, and then people would move on to another place to mix and, and finish up the records. So kind of moving on, I went on to this place um, called Chalice, which is in Hollywood. Great place there. They have uh, – then they had an 88R – and uh, like a 9000J or something. And it's a great place. It's a big, more R&B hip-hop place these days. When I was there, they were doing still a little bit of rock and things like that. Um, but it was, it was a great place, but it was a little bit short-lived. Um, you know, it only been open a year. It's a funny story. And um, around Christmas time, in the holidays, typically studios would slow down. And this uh, studio owner, uh, when it got to December with no bookings and maybe even into January, he freaked out and fired everybody. <laughs> <laughs> except for like one assistant and one runner. So I was a little bit new and um, on the team, so he let go of everybody, which was kind of crazy, but, you know, he just kind of freaked out. And it, it never, ever since then, I don't think they've had a problem booking it <laughs> ever. <laughs> but it kind of, it was good. It says those things happen, you know? So I spent, you know, um, after Christmas, I remember this, because there's um, Mix Magazine, or it probably still releases this, um, a directory of all the studios. And so literally I went through all the studios in, in Los Angeles and just like, sending out resumes and fax machines so it's like faxing <laughs> resumes and i was like a month and a half in so it was into february and still nothing and i couldn't even get a job at like starbucks and stuff and they wouldn't even hire me it was terrible and um fortunately my my girlfriend was, was supporting that and um then in one week um i got a call from oceanway and uh a record plant and some other place all in one week it's just like the way things happen crazy and unbeknownst to me that the room that was open at Oceanway was uh, Studio A um, with uh, Jack Joseph Puig. And uh, so, yeah, I, was, I had heard of him. I, I had records that people were mixing with him, and I knew of him. I mean, I, I couldn't say I was a huge, I mean, I was a diehard fan, but I, and I knew his work. And um, so they were like, yeah, you're going to be in Jack's room. I'm like, cool, sounds good to me. And I mean, I learned, I trained in all the rooms, but I kind of ended up being in there for five years and just to, um, yeah. So yeah, and Ocean Way, for those that don't know, has now been rebranded. They've gone back to United Recording um, because Alan Side sold it. And uh, it's uh, the, I think the, uh, it's on a movie lot, Sunset Gower. And I think now they they own it, the property management, but they've uh, luckily kept it. I mean, hopefully it'll be a heritage kind of place and they won't get rid of it. So yeah, started a five-year, 10-year kind of mentorship with JJP there. That's amazing. And, um, and, and most of the time we were mixing probably 
80 percent. I mean, he'd still we produced a couple of records or he did. And I kind of moved up from just assisting to kind of like him relying a little bit more on my engineering and just let him letting me do it. Um, so I think a thing, uh, you know, working with Jack, he's a great mixer. But I think a lot of people don't know him for his, his recording. His engineering is amazing. Just, you know, just putting up mics and recording. He's He's got an amazing ear to it. So, mm-hmm. well, obviously, working with a guy like JJP, it seemed like at the time, it sounded like you were kind of cutting your teeth and learning a lot more and really trying to get your, your foot in the door and, you know, solidify a spot. What kind of lessons do you learn from a guy like JJP? Like, and you, you were there for five or 10 years, so I'm sure it was quite a bit. Yeah, the, the first, you know, um, listening. And I think um, it's just like the first year. I, the, the, you know, the first couple months, even like six months, like when he would start mixing, he would actually ask me to leave the room. <laughs> I don't, I mean, though people have got their things and their privacy and he, you know, um, there's a certain amount of protection of this, you know, in, this is 20 years ago almost. And, and, you know, so I think the privacy and the lure of like, you know, what is he using? What's he putting on his mixes? And, you know, sometimes people are protective about those things. I think these days people kind of let it go. You know, a 57, everybody can use it many different ways, right? But I don't know. It's a trust thing, too. He, You know, he doesn't know if I'm going to say something stupid to the client sometimes or, you know. But after a couple of months, he kind of like got, we got comfortable and he was cool with it. And, and it would just be like listening. He would just, you know, say, you know, because the way we had it set up, it was uh, the focus right. And so he would be in the center and I have a station to the right. We had dual dual monitors so we could both like do pro tools if we needed to. But he would just do things. He'd be like, you know, what am I EQing here? Don't look. And he would do something. I'm like, ah, you're EQing the vocals. You know, they sound brighter. And he's like, no, that's the overheads. You know, that's more just I'm adding like a little twelve K. So hmm. it was a lot about listening not to what you're EQing, but how it affects things around it. So it was a a lot of a lot of listening, um, a lot of A Bing you know, uh, a lot about tone and, and color, uh, with him. So the, yeah, the, the most important thing is just the hours of listening. Um, you know, listening more than you're tweaking a knob. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. Cause it's like, kind of like you said of that, that mystique of, you know, what kind of stuff is he putting on to, to make his mixes sound so great and how you weren't, you weren't able to go in the room, but then you enter and it's, it's, nothing different it's it's just no using it's, your it's ears, just right? it's just using your ears you know and i think it's a it's a comfort thing you know it's just everybody has their space and, and mixing can be very solitary and i think that's a little bit of it too is just like when you want to get in the headspace you know you it is kind of cool that's what one of the things i like about mixing is it's solitary but then you do i like just as much working with a band but you know um yeah you just find out yeah he's just mixing he's using the same thing it's all out there now these everybody's doing their plugins and presets and you know you can use a preset and is it going to give you the sound that kind of starts it gives you an idea of what they're doing you're like hey I'm, you know mid-range top end low end what else can we do with it <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. so it's um yeah everybody realized oh he's just you know what is he doing what's well, doing everything everybody else is kind of doing it's yeah just this way he puts it together, I suppose. Yeah. So on the topic of learning to listen then, yeah. any tips for learning to listen? Because that seems simple, but I feel like it's such uh, an overlooked thing. You Okay, so the way I look at it is you go broad to, to um, um, kind of a macro setting to kind of a, a zoomed setting to a macro. It's like a close-up. So when you're listening, you listen to the whole piece. You listen to all the elements, how they relate. And, you know, be pretty broad about low, mids, and highs. Don't get too you know, much more specific right away. And then you start to focus in on like certain elements, you know, what things are in the the top end, the mid range, the low end, learn how to kind of zoom in, focus in on it and then zoom out, but don't get stuck in one particular thing. It's always about kind of keeping the, you know, 10,000 foot view and perspective of it. Um, It's like the idea of using a solo button. You kind of want to see what it sounds like, but you don't want to live there exclusively because it's about how it relates to the other things. So it's like, it's like, photography or or visual layout or or design, I think, um, is you look at negative space. You look at where or listen for what's not in a hole. Or if you're listening for the snare, you listen to it, how it relates to the low end of the snare relates to the bass or relates to the low end of the vocals, how things tie together. So it's not just about one entity. It's about how it sits around it what's what it's affecting so you if you're eqing an element you listen to actually how it's affecting everything else around it but not that element so the idea of listening to the negative space i, I don't know how else to say it but no that makes total sense i love that, yeah. that, that, that i think that's so important because so many people just get focused on that one thing and mm-hmm. they they, forget, they lose sight of the rest of the like the big picture 
Yeah, the big picture. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You do have to kind of go in and out a little bit and, and keep mm-hmm. your perspective in space, right? Mm-hmm. So that being said, um, when you're starting a mix, then how do you like to start your mixes? Where, what's your mindset uh, going into it? Mindset. Um, I pretty much <laughs> listen to it a couple times. I walk around. Um, I, try, I try to figure out what the song is about, what, what's driving it. Um, what, what's, you know, main ryth- rhythmic things, uh, the melody, obviously, what's the lead, what's accompaniment, what's support, um, where the kind of hooks are. Um, just assessing it, you know, are there any issues? Do I hear any kind of clarity, um, tonal things? Uh, I mean, basic timing, tuning things, how those how those things kind of feel. So I just kind of try to get the gist of what they're saying. And then as far as starting the mix, it's uh, rhythm section. I, I come from the DJ standpoint, I think. And so it's always about rhythm and making it feel good. So drums, bass, anything playing, rhythmic kind of figures. Um, the pulse of it. And with that, I, I kind of always will keep in, I don't just kind of, you know, I'll start off with the balance. And if they send me a session that the balance is already there, I'll probably turn everything off and then kind of unmute things and kind of build it back up again. Um, then when I'm again, still kind of starting, I'll start focusing on a drum. So I'll probably turn everything off. Um, I don't leave that too long. I probably get to the vocals on. I like to hear again, how it's relating to everybody around it. So I don't live with everything turned off. I, I, I think I used to start that way. It would be like drums for like two hours, <laughs> which is just off. I don't know. I just can't do that. I mean, that's, a, that's, you know, I did, I like it's all about context. So I, I, I really mix around what's already there slightly, even if it's at a low level, I'll keep checking it against the vocals. And so once a rhythm section's in, I go right to the kind of the main, whatever lead element is, but vocals or, you know, most cases it's going to be vocals. So I have the vocals in there and I'll do a bit of tweaking to those. And so the foundational elements like that third guitar overdub or synth line, I'm, I'm not too concerned with right away. Like mm-hmm. that, those kind of things. So rhythm for sure. Yeah. Um, then it kind of goes to tone and timbre. Like it's a lot of, um, after that, it's like, do I need to, does this need tonal help? You know, whether it was recorded acoustically or in the box. So um, those are things I'm looking at. Yeah. I, I love that perspective too of like kind of, you know, even though you do start with a rhythm, you are still listening to everything else in context. Cause yeah, I think there's so many people that just start off with like a soloed kick. And then they add the snare <laughs> and then they yeah, build up. Yeah, I remember up. those days. I don't know. Like that, a lot of people do it that way, but it's like, all right. I mean, I remember being in session where we're like 15, 20 minutes on a solo kick drum. Like, I mean, it's not that I won't listen to it that cumulatively over time, but I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's, I feel silly sometimes now, that, but I think everybody <laughs> goes through that. And still people probably, obviously, if you're mixing like that, it, whatever approach you're taking, I'm sure is, is good. But for me, it, now the where I'm at, it doesn't work as well for me. Well, the thing is, like, even if you did start that way, eventually, once you start adding the guitars and the vocals and everything, yeah. you're gonna have to go back to that kick drum. I would make the drums so massive. <laughs> <laughs> the drums would be like explosive, and and I think I, that's what I learned with Jack is like, because like the drums are just like I don't know, like love recording drums and mixing, and and so I think that's from definitely a Jack thing, and they would sound massive. Like every time, it's like. Just as long as they sound like John Bonham, it's good. <laughs> Something like that, right? And then eventually I get mad because I'm like, but the drums, but the drums. I could not keep the perspective of the song, like starting off because I was so fixated coming kind of from hip hop and stuff like that. It's always drum based or some kind of drums that need to sound massive and tough sounding. And they would be reduced to these little entities, which is, it makes total sense now. They can't always have this dominant kind of force. They can, if you've got the finesse, they should. But um, yeah, you, you put them in, you're like, they can't really be that big the whole time, can they? <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, and that's just the solo effect, right? Like when you're, yeah, yeah. when you're listening to your drums, you're going to make them sound massive, but then. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like, you use up everything. That's what I found is like, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta keep the room and, build around it um because you spend too long on it you're like yeah you start using everything up it's like full frequency drums and they sound great but unfortunately it's not a drum solo record so yeah maybe and, and it's the same with vocals too right <laughs> everyone if they're soloing um, the vocals is going to add a ton of reverb to it to fill it out and then afterwards yeah. it's like okay well now the mix just sounds muddy yeah yeah you got to be careful on, on that that's i think that's why i think I'm, it's like mixing in context a lot yeah um just keeping keeping that perspective um, for sure so then in the end, what makes a, a great mix then? Like, what are you trying to achieve? You forget about the mix. You don't listen to all the stuff. You listen to the <laughs> song. <laughs> That's what it makes a good mix for me. It's like, you don't hear the mix. It, you listen to the song yeah. and you're in that place. I think um, I think that's what it is. I think you can turn it up. And it's not fatiguing. You know, it's not, 
you know, draining in certain cases. Um, if, a good mix is something that, you know, it's like a song. It's like Easter eggs are left. You go back and like, oh, I didn't hear that before. And now I hear it. Um, I think those are the things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun as like mixing is. It's like the whole idea is you want people not to like listen to that cool effect. It's like, you know, you want them to be pull, pulled into the song. Very true. How long does it normally take you to finish a mix? Uh, it depends on if it's like voice and guitar hour, you know, so <laughs> vocals and stuff, pretty quick. Um, bigger more complex arrangements and, and track count kind of thing uh you know the good couple hours half a day day may, maybe longer but um I, I try, you know maybe with recalls it goes into a day and a half um i think uh coming from with jack's world it was the standard was like a day per song would be pretty classic in those days i think um don't necessarily have i've got to work a little faster these days for some reason or i don't necessarily have the luxury but i think if you look at the recalls I just space it out. I don't really sit down and do one song a day anymore. I'll work on one song, move to another one, and just with schedules and stuff, people are flexible. So they're like, yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be done tomorrow. So over like two weeks, I'll work on a variety of things. So maybe a day and a half at the end of the day with recalls and prints and stuff like that. Yeah. And and you said that now you work a little bit faster. Yeah, that's too. I think I hopefully I've gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, at, at what point did you feel like you started to really make good mixes? Like, is it, that, that obviously must have come into play. Yet? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it must have to some degree because um, now you have the confidence to finish a mix earlier, right? Except acceptable mix. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I think uh, I think somewhere. So after JJP, I went to work with Beck for about uh, for two years. Um, I was with Beck uh, every day as his engineer and then mixing his kind of in-house stuff. And um, I think uh, we did this series called Record Club, and I and I got to mix a couple of those, I think, record clubs through part of one song on two, three, and four that we did total. Uh, Daryl Thorpe was mixing the other ones and, and recorded it, and Danny Kalb had recorded some of it. But um, I think that's the first ones that were kind of mixes that I did were released, and I did a mix for um, the Twilight soundtrack um, with Beck that he did. And I think that was probably the one of the first big ones that I did. Um, so I guess that I guess that would be that would be it. So that's awesome. Yeah, but I'm working with a guy like Beck. He he's well known, obviously, for having these really creative sonic textures and you know really big performances. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of creativity there. So, how has that influenced the work that you do? Is there anything that you like to do with your mixes that other people might think is crazy now? Um, I like that question when you put that on there. I think um, Jack and 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 Beck like. The apples and oranges, like the two different approaches. I mean, as a lot of people are, which is great. I, I got from, you know, a lot of stuff for J Jack. We could occasionally be really focused on radio singles and, and stuff like that. I mean, and then Beck was, it was so creative. Not that Jack wasn't creative, but, you know, the one example that, that Beck gave me, and I think this actually came with a com from a conversation with Nigel Godrich, and I was mixing, and, and Beck was like, you just got to sometimes just take a bucket of orange paint and pour it on it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's, that's the directive, you know? So, <laughs> and, and, and what he meant was you just got to get some attention. Sometimes you just got to do something that is crazy. And I don't really have an example of what would be crazy like that. It's more, it's obviously abstract in the statement, but it's like, maybe it's just a contrast and maybe like something super wet against something super dry. Um, or just something super, you know, crunchy and then something super pristine like this always as Beck as an artist is, he's always mixed like this lo-fi, hi-fi kind of thing. Um, and he's covered all these different boundaries of Sonics, um, with his records. Um, yeah. So in that, when you had that question with something that's crazy, I don't think there's anything that can be crazy enough in music. Um, besides lately, and yeah, no, not besides, I don't know, I was going to say something, but um. Yeah, I don't have a great example for that. No, one. but I, like, I, I, I get everything's that. like yeah. It was just more. It's more of a figure of speech, obviously. Um, but it's just uh, contrast and, yeah. and juxtaposition. That would be the best way to answer like something that's crazy. Like it's always about t messing around. Like you know, with the parameters of like you know, you could look at like street art or culture versus high art you know it's super snobby but then you mix something that's kind of street based inside of it and it has this cool juxtaposition against it so and same thing in music whether it's comes with the song but in you know whether it's using that something like a super you know very we'll say digital kind of maybe 
plugin or you know and then use something that's super lo-fi piece of analog gear like a radio speaker or boom box and, mm-hmm. and you mix those together i don't know there's something kind of cool about yeah. that that marriage no, I lo- I love how you put that of of marrying the wet with the dry kind of thing. Like that that's something that I could say that I definitely learned from you and working with you producing mm-hmm. our band. Like mm-hmm. where, you know, you were like, let's fuck around with pedals for a little bit. Let's just like <laughs> let's get some crazy sounds. And and yeah. listening back to it, we never would have thought that way. Mm-hmm. You know, we just kind of thought, ah, oh, just straight up rock. But like, yeah, adding, adding these textures and stuff like that in the background really helped elevate the the atmosphere and the mood of the song. So. Yeah, that's cool. Like, I'm glad that that you guys got that. And from that, I think that's if I someone asked me like my approach and what I kind of what I'm teaching and 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 work with artists. I think that's the thing that um, is establishing that that landscape and then th- those subtle textures. I think of uh, and the analogy of kind of painting and um, whether using like oil paint or watercolors versus spray paint. And uh, you look at some of the impressionistic paintings, and you look at if you go see them in in person. Um, and you see how thick the paint is just like massively sitting off the painting. It's like there's these mountains inside of it. And I think that's really interesting. I think of sound that same way that it's immersive and you think of it in textures of wooliness and, you know, uh, you know, whether it's like cotton or, you know, silk mm-hmm. or glass and you have all in and, and making that uh, making sound kind of exist in that same form yeah so i think um that's a that's a thing for from beck for sure it's like those textures of just developing even you know messing around with pedals for a while you may only use one little moment of it but that's all it takes it's like it's the right amount it's about finding uh you know the ceiling what like what's too much what's too distorted what's too wet what's too dry and um once you find that you may only need a piece of it but yeah Yeah. something about that that pulls you into it for sure and I, i think that that's just that's a sign of an experienced engineer too, to to experiment with stuff because a lot of people when they're first starting off they're just they're playing it too safe because mm-hmm. yeah you know. that's that's a great point there. Um, if I were you know advice kind of things is like you know what when I went mixing it took me so long to get somewhere because I'd be oh I'm gonna add a little EQ that's like three dB whoa should I stop is that too much or like what's compressing I can almost hear it and then. <laughs> And now it's just like, you got to find the ceiling. Just find out. Is it too distorted, too crunchy, too bright? If you don't find the ceiling, you're just going to take baby steps there. And it's going to take you forever to get there. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like recording now when I record because I spend so much time mixing. It's like, oh yeah, compression, delay, reverb. I want it to sound like, you know, the band wants it to sound like when it's done because it's going to make them respond differently. And it's to get, and if you go too far, you learn your lesson. You don't do it again next time, right? For sure. Otherwise, you're just you're inching along, and and because we can live in a recall safe world and and not taking chances, you know what? If you if you mess something up, you don't do it again, and and maybe hopefully there's a beauty in that that accident um, and accepting them for sure um, and accepting our imperfection. Yep. But you're also in an interesting perspective where you said you're you're now teaching mm-hmm. and you're teaching production stuff. What kind of like you obviously see a lot of different sessions come in from different students and. What kind of problems do you typically see in the sessions that you're reviewing? I think sometimes maybe relying too much on headphones. We don't have experience of good monitoring. It really comes down to kind of monitoring sometimes. So good speakers, treated room. Uh, once you do that, you can certainly use headphones, and, and people do it all the time But I, until I think you have experience enough with proper monitoring. I think that's one thing. Um issues um well there's from different standpoints there's mixing and production and, and sometimes in production it it's all about like does the song work first as an arrangement are the sections in the right places do we need a tambourine throughout the whole song it's like no just don't record it where it doesn't need to be you're not going to put it in the first verse don't record it there because <laughs> otherwise these days people just record it and say you figure out the arrangements mixer and it's like no i mean i can and i the mute button is the first thing i go for is muting something like <laughs> does it even need to be there it's not about eqing and compressing it's like does it even need to be there what's the the purpose so kind of like less is more like how much can i take out to make it work and then when i need it i'll add it in um so there's kind of arrangement and production things that i always look at um from a recording standpoint with gear these days and not going to tape you don't find things as dull and dark anymore it comes in a little bit snappier and brighter typically i think because of you know converters and maybe uh gear um as well um trying to think like as students well i just figured as students like with a lot of students you'd probably see a lot of like 
the the whole gamut of what you said, the production side and the the mixing side, you're going to see yeah, a lot it, of mistakes. It's expansive. Um, mistakes. Um, or not necessarily mistakes, it, but just like yeah. things that could be handled better, Le- right? Better, right? Um, low end management's tricky. Um, always knowing how to kind of get enough sub versus punch. Um, so then, on that man- topic, like, how do you go about handling your low end, and and what would you recommend? Uh, you know, you decide kind of how the low end is going to work is the base, you know, what, what's, you know, again, if, you know, what's the fundamental note in the parts being played? Um, are, can, are they complementary? Are you playing off them? Do you make that low end, the kick and the bass work together as one whole entity? Kind of like, you know, Motown-ish, you know, 70s where it's like the low end, the bass is just like this thing. It's not kick or bass, it's all together. Um, or is the kick going to be punchier on top and the bass has got a subbiness like the low E's, like sitting down underneath it? Um, so I just kind of figure out how I'm going to structure them. Um, uh, how do I manage it you know filtering it helps you know clean things out i like kind of richer sounding records so i'm I'm not that guy it's like oh yeah and guitars let's always put a high pass filter on and uh, up to 300 hertz it's like well what what's the low e on the guitar fundamental note you know is that i mean if they're not playing it they're not playing it but if it's there why, why take it off and, you know um it just depends though like if it's metal or something yeah you got to really skew you know it's a different treatment um i think for it's it's always going to be genre based right what you can get away with and, and the style of the music um so monitoring's the first thing um i try to you know leave space for those elements um so yeah filtering it's it's just like subtractive eq just like getting somebody out of the way um, you know, see if something's masking something, you know, when they need to add up together, make sure they add up together to make it kind of, um, strong. So yeah, little filtering, little EQ. Um, it always comes back again to the arrangement and the way the parts play too. For um, sure. So. Yeah. And to kind of tie to the question of, you know, with your student sessions and the, the things that you see that can be improved, you know, I, I think that we all learn from a lot of trial and error and making mistakes in the studio, and we've mm-hmm. all done it, and we all learn those lessons. Do you have any examples of anything that has gone horribly wrong in a session that you learned a lesson from or something that just really sticks out? Uh, not being in record when you should have been in record, for sure. Missing, you know, you know not looking down and thinking you, you quick punched it in or something. <laughs> uh, but I think with Pro Tools 2018 now, they've got that auto recover, or like it's always recording. Ableton's got that, I think. I only recently right. heard about that. Right, so I don't think that's going to be so much a problem anymore. But always being in record, um, just being prepared. Um, let You know, a soloing stuff after you do like the first pass, making sure there's no noise, hums, things like that. Uh, click bleed. That's a thing that's kind of a drag. You realize that a fade out like a like an open sustain moment and you take you know behind you, that's like awful. Um so just making sure you double check things like that um before you kind of really full on go into recording mode. Um so there's nothing terribly like I don't have that thing of like re- erasing somebody's moment on like a <laughs> tape machine or something or um I'm obviously stuff has happened. Um, um you know, fallible for sure. But yeah. um, th- I think those general guidelines always being in record, um, double checking after you're kind of tracking, um, mixing, uh, you know, backups, obviously, you know, yep. triple, double, triple backups, um, constantly um, printing, um, I guess in the mixing these days, listening to your mix when you print it, like do, no, don't check emails, don't be doing this, you know, make sure there's no, you know, no clips, you know, nothing's distorted. Um, you know, monitor, check your prints before you send them off and things like that. For sure. Um, I do have one actually kind of thing. Uh, when I was assisting, uh, I had to send a, some, a STEM session. Uh, it's for Mary J. Blige and uh, off. And I didn't want to go into the studio and the the intern called me and said, hey, they need this um, package or they need some stems. And I'm like, okay, here's what you need to do. The file's ready to go. All you have to do is burn it. And this is burning CD. So... I, I left it up to the intern to do it, <laughs> which is not a, a good thing. It's like, so always do it yourself when you can. And um, so so basically what he did is he, he burned a blank disc and sent it to New York. And oh, like, no. on Monday, I get a call from uh, Mary's uh, manager, which is her husband, Ken Do, And he was like, there's nothing on this disc. And we're all, we're all sitting here in the studio. And I'm like, oh, shit. I felt so. That was, that's a pretty bad one. Yeah, and I just one. melted. And what you do is, any problem, you say, I'm sorry. I fucked up. Um, how can I fix it? And I was like, I'll go right now to the studio. I'll upload it, send it to you. I'll have it 
shortly in a couple hours. And I think that worked out and I, I didn't get fired from it. So that's a pretty major one. Yeah. Right? Is, um, I, I, it's just with, you know, teaching and things like that and kids, you always say, you know, I fucked up. Sorry. How can I fix it? What can I do to make it right? Not a bunch of excuses. Yeah, for so. sure. I think, I think that's a big lesson to learn because you gotta, you gotta keep those relationships and, and be honest with everybody. Yeah, that's a that's a major thing. Um, is, is accepting that fault. we're we're gonna make mistakes. It's just like how can you how can you fix it? Um, make you know apologize, empathy, empathy, em- being empathetic and and um, respectful for sure. For, for sure. Well, I know that uh, we're cutting it a little bit close to a meeting that you got to take off for, so we should probably start to wrap this up. If people want to learn more about you, how can they find you online? <laughs> that's a good. <laughs> you got a fax machine? <laughs> no, I heard Pigeon. Um, no, no. <laughs> I know I'm so bad. I actually have fallen off on that, all that. I, I email. That's really all I have right now. I, I don't do anything um, on there just with being busy. It's nothing against it. I just don't have the time. But I, I think maybe I'll get back into it. But so it's uh, Dean A Nelson at gmail dot com. So if you want to reach out that way, classic email. I don't know. That's it. You know, that's that's the way it is. And uh, yeah, questions, thoughts. If if anybody's a uh, you know website designer actually my wife is supposed to be doing that for me so. <laughs> but i don't know website i don't know that's there's so many different things i just get overwhelmed with yeah there's, there's a lot of options out there for that kind of stuff i like the good old-fashioned phone and, and conversation it's, yeah it's cool fair enough and lastly any cool projects that you're working on right now that you can talk about yeah um so a uh, great artist from uh montreal named paper beat scissors um so i'm mixing some songs for for tim um and uh another artist my father's son uh, and uh, he's actually based out of Montreal as well. Um, those are two records I'm mixing, and then a guy, Jeremy Benjamin, uh, it's on True North Records, and we're working on his record that's coming up um, for next year. So those are the a couple things, but uh, yeah, that's Anybody awesome. Else wants some stuff done? Let me know. Can't wait to hear them. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for doing this, and it was great to catch up with you. And yeah, uh, right. yeah I'd love to chat again. Awesome, man. We'll talk to you later. So that was my interview with Dean Nelson. Man, I had a great time chatting with that guy and getting caught up. It's been a little while since we last talked, so uh, it was great to get caught up. But uh, I love everything he had to say in that interview there, especially the part about listening. I think the way he described the process of listening was really, really cool. And um, I love that that was the secret that... Jack Joseph Puig was hiding from him when he first started interning. And and I love that story about not being able to enter the control room while he mixed because, you know, he didn't want Dean to get in the way. And, you know, in the end, it was all because he just wanted to listen properly. And I, I think that that says a lot about the way the masters work. Uh, so really, really fun story. And I, I love the way Dean describes the process of listening because I think it's it's so important and people really need to sit down and actually analyze what they're doing rather than just diving head first and messing around with stuff like just listen to the track first it's it's crucial to the process and you will create much better records as a result of it so anyway that was my chat with dean i hope you enjoyed it just as much as i did and if you're new to master your mix please make sure to check out the website masteryourmix.com and on the website As soon as you go there, you'll see a pop-up come up and you can download your free copy of The Ultimate Mixing Blueprint, which is a guide that I've put together to help you with learning how to EQ and use compression in your mixes. And we go over all of the different frequency ranges that you need to pay attention to when you're mixing, as well as some compression settings that will help get you started and get you great results right away. Also, if you're a fan of this podcast, I would really appreciate it if you go onto iTunes and leave a rating and review. By doing that, it allows us to get exposed to more people and move up in the Apple and Google ratings, which is huge for this podcast. So I would really appreciate it if you could do that. And other than that, that's pretty much it for this episode. I'll talk to you in the next one. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.